Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. In this video, I will cover complications of diabetes. Be sure to check out my first video on diabetes to understand the pathophysiology, investigations, management and much, much more. Let's begin. Cardiovascular disease is a very common complication of diabetes mellitus. This can include hypertension, ischemic heart disease, TIAs or strokes, retinopathy and peripheral artery disease. The cardiovascular risks associated with diabetes are reduced by lowering blood pressure using an ACE inhibitor, which is renoprotective, aiming to keep the blood pressure below 140 over 90 or below 130 over 80 if there are already signs of end organ damage like retinopathy or CKD. Modifiable risk factors should also be managed. Patients should be advised to lose weight if appropriate, stop smoking and improve their diet. Lipid modifying drugs like statins are also given if the Q risk score is 10% or above. Diabetic nephropathy is a common complication of diabetes and it can result in CKD and renal failure. People with diabetes are screened for diabetic nephropathy annually by checking the albumin to creatinine ratio in an early morning urine sample. If the ratio is above 2.5, then this is indicative of microalbuminuria, which is a sign of diabetic nephropathy. This is managed by reducing the blood pressure to prevent further damage with an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin II receptor antagonist, even if the baseline blood pressure is normal. It's also important to prescribe a statin if the Q-risk is above 10% and ensure tight glycemic control. Diabetic retinopathy is another complication of diabetes that can result in visual impairment and reduced quality of life. It can either be proliferative or non-proliferative. In proliferative diabetic retinopathy, there is retinal neovascularization. This has a worse prognosis than non-proliferative. In mild non-proliferative nephropathy, one or more microaneurysms are seen on slit lamp examination of the retina. In the moderate stage, there are also blot hemorrhages, hard exudates and cotton wool spots. In the severe stage, there are blot hemorrhages, microaneurysms in all four quadrants, venous beading in two or more quadrants, and microaneurysms in one or more quadrants. Diabetic retinopathy can be prevented and its progression slowed by keeping the HbA1c below 53 millimoles per mole and blood pressure below 130 over 80. In the UK, any patient with diabetes aged 12 and over will be invited for diabetic retinopathy screening annually. Diabetic neuropathy describes pain and reduced sensation in a glove and stocking distribution, which means it starts at the peripheries and ascends, typically occurring in people with a long history of poorly controlled diabetes. It can result in a Charcot joint. Patients with diabetes can be screened for neuropathy using a 10G monofilament. Neuropathic pain can be managed using TCAs or anti-epileptics like pregabalin. People with diabetes often get foot infections due to a combination of neuropathy, peripheral artery disease and increased susceptibility to infections. These infections include infected foot ulcers, cellulitis, abscesses, tendonitis and septic arthritis. Diabetic foot ulcers have a punched out appearance and occur on the pressure sites of the feet, like the heels. Diabetic complications may sometimes present as an emergency, like DKA, HHS or hypoglycemia. DKA is a complication of type 1 diabetes and it's diagnosed when there is hyperglycemia, where the glucose is above 11, high serum ketones, where the serum ketones are above 3, or there are ketones plus plus on urine dipstick, and either acidosis, where the pH is less than 7.3, or low bicarbonate, where the bicarbonate levels are less than 15 millimoles per litre. Some symptoms and signs of DKA include abdominal pain, 
cosmol respiration, pear drop smelling breath, polydipsia, polyuria, and clinical dehydration. Patients should be managed using an A to E approach. Serum and urine glucose and ketone levels should be measured and a VBG should also be done. DKA is managed by giving the patient lots of IV sodium chloride, one litre in the first hour, along with IV rapid acting insulin at the rate of 0.1 unit per kilo per hour. Long acting subcutaneous insulin should be continued. Potassium chloride is also added to the fluids if there is hypokalemia. Serum ketone and glucose levels should be monitored hourly and potassium levels should be measured hourly for the first two hours and then every two hours. This is because potassium enters the cells along with glucose. So as glucose is driven into the cells by insulin treatment, the potassium levels in the blood will drop. Once the blood glucose levels come down to under 14 millimoles per litre, then IV glucose 10% is given in addition to the saline infusion to prevent hypoglycemia. The insulin infusion can be stopped after the patient has started eating and drinking again, their pH is over 7.3 and serum ketones are below 0.3 millimoles per litre. They should have had their usual subcut rapid acting insulin before their meal and then the insulin infusion can be stopped 30 to 60 minutes after their meal. Hyperglycemic hyperosmotic state is a complication of type 2 diabetes where the glucose levels are above 30 millimoles per mole and there's also hypovolemia, hyperviscosity of blood and severe electrolyte abnormalities. Patients may present with weakness, fatigue, headaches, nausea and vomiting or symptoms of thromboses. It is managed with IV fluids, VTE prophylaxis and correction of any electrolyte imbalances as well as a review of medications and compliance. Insulin is only given if there is significant ketonemia. Metformin can be stopped for a few days as there is a risk of metabolic acidosis. A diabetic nurse review before discharge can prevent recurrence and improve long-term outcomes. HHS has a higher mortality rate than DKA. Some complications include thrombosis, stroke and MI. Hypoglycemia management depends on the clinical presentation. If the patient can swallow, then they can be given a fast-acting carbohydrate like 5 glucose tablets or a glass of fruit juice as well as a long-acting carbohydrate like toast or biscuits. If the patient is conscious but cannot swallow, then glucose gel can be squirted onto the gums. If the patient is unconscious, then 150 ml of 10% glucose IV should be given stat. If there is no IV access, then IM glucagon 1 mg can be given instead. After administering treatment, BM should be done 10 minutes after and a long-acting carbohydrate must be given if possible to prevent refractory hypoglycemia. Clinicians should consider the causes, which may include AKI, poor oral intake or vomiting or diarrhea. Thanks for watching.